Hello, 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 Dr. T.E. here, and welcome to the final lecture in this basic, but not so basic, introductory series on MRI physics. We've covered some very complex subjects so far, starting with the nuclear magnetic resonance phenomenon itself, and how we can take advantage of this physical property to record a signal within our receiver coils. But we didn't stop there. We then pioneered some clever methods to localize the signal coming from each individual voxel within a slice, and this allowed us to build a picture. It may not have been a picture of any value, but at minimum, a picture. And that brings us to the previous lecture, where we went into deep philosophical questions of what image contrast really is, and how differences in T2 decay rates and T1 recovery times impact our image contrast. Links to all of these lectures are above, as well as in the video description. Go check them out if you need a refresher. And after all of that, we have one final piece of the puzzle to solve, and that is how does the T1 recovery time relate to our T2 decay curves? As we've said over and over, our machine can only directly see this process known as T2 decay. But we have T1 weighted images, so we know that there has to be a relationship between these two processes. Let's start by closely examining the timelines of these two graphs. While they look like they are occurring over a similar time interval as drawn, this is because there's only so much space on the screen I can draw both graphs. Remember that this process of T1 recovery occurs over a much longer time interval than T2 decay, as we detailed in depth on our previous lecture. We need to now define where these are occurring with regards to our excitation RF pulse. In the case of the T1 recovery graph, this process takes place immediately after our initial excitation pulse, where we've used up the net magnetization we've built to generate our signal, and then have to wait for the tissues in each voxel to rebuild their net magnetizations, as shown by the curves in this graph. So in this context, where, or more importantly which, RF pulse is being shown in our T2 decay graph, it is actually TR, the next RF pulse we apply. This is a subtle but very important distinction when trying to understand this relationship. If we were to apply our next RF pulse here, it would generate these T2 decay curves we see on the right. In the previous lecture, we showed that this time until our next RF pulse, the time of repetition TR, will in fact affect the amplitudes of our T2 decay curves. Now watch what happens to our T2 decay curves when we shorten TR. And when we lengthen TR? Let's show it one more time. As we shorten TR, we affect the overall amplitude of our T2 decay curves, particularly the starting points. And when TR is long, and we've allowed each voxel to fully rebuild their net magnetizations, the starting amplitudes of the T2 decay curves are similar. There aren't large differences at the start, but as the curves decay at different rates as time goes on, the differences get larger and larger. So if we choose to compare these curves at a long time of echo, TE, the differences in our measurements will mainly be due to the different T2 decay rates. This would produce a T2 weighted image, which requires a long TR to minimize differences produced by tissue T1 recovery time and a long TE to maximize signal differences from varying T2 decay rates. Now let's say we want to create a T1 weighted image. We've already shown that we need a short TR to catch these tissues at different stages of rebuilding its net magnetization. So what will we choose for our TE to maximize different measurements on our T2 decay curves? We would select a short TE, as you can see that at this point is where our calculated current coming from each of these voxels will have wide variation between each tissue. So a T1 weighted image will have a short TR on the order of 100 to 1000 milliseconds and a short TE around 10 milliseconds. This allows most of the differences in our measurement to arrive from differences in T1 effects and minimize contributions from different T2 decay rates. Why don't we try some other combinations? We're not limited to just these. What if we choose a longish TR and a shortish TE? What kind of a contrasted picture will we get? We should get at least more T2 weighting from the picture than before, right? Because we increase TE. 
This is what we call a proton density or PD weighted image, which has a longer-ish TR of 1000 to 3000 milliseconds and a short-ish TE of around 20 milliseconds. A lot of you people out there are probably scratching your heads while the musculoskeletal folks are jumping around with joy. It's called proton density because there's a better correlation on this sequence with the amount of protons a tissue contains and how much signal we see. Let's take a look at a proton density weighted image and see if this correlates. Here's an axial slice of the brain on a proton density weighted image. We don't use this sequence a lot in specialties outside of musculoskeletal radiology, but there's something a little off here. Soft tissue is a little denser than water, and you can see the brain cortex here is very bright and hard to differentiate from the CSF along the edges they share because they're so similar in signal. But then we go to the white matter and it's darker than the cortical matter and CSF, which may be puzzling at first, but what does white matter contain? Myelin, which is fat, so it's less dense than cortical matter and therefore darker on our image. Now this really doesn't provide us with any more useful information in the brain than just a regular T2 weighted sequence. But when looking at a joint, it's pretty good at differentiating cartilage from other surrounding tissues such as the subchondral bone and fluid within the joint. So it's found a nice little niche in musculoskeletal radiology. Remember that ultimately we're developing sequences to give us good tissue contrast to help identify pathology, not some pre-prescribed values of TR and TE set in stone to meet a made-up definition of image weighting. So here you can see and compare the three main ways we modify our image parameters to accentuate our image contrast for T1 effects, T2 effects, or a mixture of both. For all of you taking boards, you just have to memorize these values. Remembering TR is always greater than TE. We're never going to apply our next baseline pulse before recording the signal we generated from the previous baseline pulse. Notice I'm using the word baseline here as we've gotten pretty creative at introducing additional pulses in between all of these. Maybe we'll do a lecture just on pulse sequences in the future. So here's a question for you. There's one combination we haven't tried. What if we choose a short TR and a long TE? What kind of image weighting will this produce? This is nonsense, a common piece of trickery for board exams. Don't give them the satisfaction of falling for this. Remember that TE should always be significantly shorter than TR. So let's take what we've learned and put this all together and show how both our time of echo TE and our time of repetition TR are related on a single timeline. I think this is another major question that is often overlooked and causes a lot of confusion. So at time zero, after putting someone in the scanner and waiting for the full magnetization to build in the body, we apply our initial RF pulse. This gives us our precession in the XY plane where we record our signal T2 decay. We know with modern MRI machines, we typically do other things to make the signal re-emerge as an echo, but that just adds complexity to our picture, so pretend that this is all we want to record, our free induction decay as it's termed. Our signal fizzles out and then we wait, and wait, and wait for our net magnetization to fully rebuild in the background, which we cannot see, and when it's regained the value we wish, we apply our next excitation pulse. On this timeline, our TE would be selected anywhere along this recorded signal, the point at which we're going to calculate and compare the T2 decay curves coming from the entire slice. Our TR will be this time from our initial RF pulse to when we decide to excite the system again. As you can see here, we've made something akin to a very simple pulse diagram. Notice again that TR is always going to be longer than TE, and they both do occur on the same timeline. Hopefully this visually makes sense now. Finally, I want to point out a subtle bit of terminology that now should make much more sense. Have you ever wondered why we use the term T1 weighting or T2 weighting? Why even use this term when more commonly you just see images referenced to as T1 or T2? It should now be clear that this is the only signal our MRI machine records the T2 decay of each individual voxel in a slice all added together. But we showed the signal is directly affected by how big of a net magnetization we've built before excitation with our next RF pulse. 
So our signal is always a combination of both the T2 decay and T1 recovery physical properties. And our images are never purely one or the other. We can only select parameters that will accentuate the effects of one over the other, thus the term weighted image. So congratulations everyone. This concludes our basic, but not so basic, introduction into MRI physics. We went into depth on the nuclear magnetic resonance phenomenon, how we can take advantage of this to record a signal, what that signal actually is, and how we can localize it to each voxel coming from the slice of the body we wish to build an image for. Finally, we went into depth on what image contrast is and how our two physical properties of T2 decay and T1 recovery can be taken advantage of to build a meaningful image. I want to personally thank all of you for sticking with me on this journey through an incredibly dull and perplexing topic. I hope you learned something valuable that will make you more confident in your daily jobs or pique your interest to study this further and be one of the next future MRI pioneers. Next up, your questions. Ask them in the video comments or send them directly to me at lightsonradiology at proton.me. There is no dumb question. This is incredibly difficult material, and your questions make me understand this material better as well. And if you want to support, please, please share these videos with your friends. Like and comment and subscribe to the channel. If you really want to show your thanks, you can donate using the links below. I should probably upgrade this microphone. I don't think it captures my true velvety Michael Douglas voice. And with that, this is Dr. T.E. signing off.